Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And today would have been their son's 41st birthday instead of celebrating with him, his family celebrating justice for him. Their son's ex-wife, Crystal Rodriguez, was sentenced for his murder. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom and shares what Rodriguez asked of the judge. While a plea deal was already agreed on, Crystal Rodriguez, along with her attorney, asked the judge to instead sentence her to 15 years for the murder of her ex-husband, 40-year-old Jared Rodriguez. I regret so much what had happened. I cannot ask for anything, but I do ask that you be just. On December of last year, Jared Rodriguez was shot in the back of the head by Crystal while their youngest child was in the next room. 399th District Judge Frank Castro reviewed the case and decided to follow the initial plea agreement. He's not going to get his life back. And, um, he's not going to get to be there with his children. Uh, you will still get a an opportunity and um, going to sentence you to the 28 years. After sentencing, Jared Rodriguez's mother faced Crystal. The most painful day of my life will always be December 17, 2021, when the detective came to my home to tell me you had shot and killed my youngest son. Unbelievable and unforgivable. Krista Rodriguez will now be transferred to a Texas state prison. She is eligible for parole after serving half of her 28 year sentence. At the Kathina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. He was a popular senior at University of the Incarnate Word. He was shot and killed steps outside of his off campus apartment by a UIW officer. Days before the wrongful death lawsuit filed by the family of Cameron Reedus was scheduled for trial, it's now been called off. That's after an agreed resolution was reached in this case. Dylan Collier on what the university avoids by not having a public trial. 23-year-old Cameron Reedus attended the same university that employed the police officer who took his life during a fateful encounter blocks from campus in December 2013. After Corporal Christopher Carter attempted to arrest Reedus on suspicion of drunk driving, the two men were involved in a physical confrontation. Carter shot the student five times, killing him. And while an autopsy revealed Reedus was under the influence of alcohol at the time of his death, Carter's work history would have likely played a more prominent role at trial. It's a history that included nine jobs at eight law enforcement agencies in less than seven years prior to landing at UIW. Months before the fatal shooting in an unrelated incident, Carter confronted a student in her dorm room in the middle of the night while investigating a possible hit and run in a parking garage. The student was not involved in the wreck. The wrongful death lawsuit filed by Reedus's family wove through the court system for eight years as attorneys for the university repeatedly argued its police force was entitled to governmental immunity. A source familiar with the court battle said details of the settlement will be confidential. Those final details could be ironed out in the next few days. UIW officials declined to comment this afternoon. Carter was cleared of criminal wrongdoing in 2015, months after he resigned from the UIW Police Department. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. A teenager now in jail for allegedly shooting a man as he stood in the street. According to San Antonio Police, 18-year-old Beto Hernandez shot a man last month near Steve's Avenue and Geavers Street. Police Hernandez followed the 46 year old man and shot him several times. The victim knew Hernandez and identified him. Police say he was upset because the victim's relative was dating a new person who used to be married to one of his family members. He's now being charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon as well as other charges from an unrelated incident. A man is behind bars tonight after police say he was responsible for several aggravated robberies in just an hour. San Antonio police say 36 year old Felipe Tijerina is the suspect in three robberies on the northwest side. According to an arrest warrant, those robberies last month were reported to police within an hour. All happened near Loop 410 and Bandera Road. SAPD says Tijerina matched the description in all three incidents. Police say they were able to identify him based on fingerprints and receipts they found in a vehicle that they believe he stole. He's been charged with two counts of aggravated robbery. And tonight, San Antonio police are looking for the suspect who allegedly shot a man following an argument. The victim left in critical condition, but was able to get to a fire station for help at the corner of Zarsamora and Calabra. 
As Katrina Weber reports, firefighters at that station had some concerns about their own safety. Black and white patrol cars far outnumber the red trucks at Fire Station 10. Police surrounded the building as they responded to a shooting, one that left a man wounded and for a time left firefighters wondering if they had dodged bullets. They told officers they were tending to the 38-year-old shooting victim who showed up at their door around 4 this morning when they heard additional gunshots that seemed to be headed their way. Police found no one and nothing else hit. Behind a store across the street, though, they found evidence of the shooting, shell casings and blood showing where it happened. Witnesses say the man had been arguing with someone who was in a car who then shot him. All along the sidewalk, you can see the path the man took, a blood trail leading from the area where he was shot to that fire station across the street. Officers at the scene told us they had reason to believe the shooting may have been connected to a drug deal and that there were three people, two men and a woman, inside the car. But they say they are still investigating. The wounded man was rushed to a hospital. The last word from police was that he was in critical condition after being shot several times. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, San Antonio police are searching for the people behind a road rage shooting on the northwest side. The shooting happened around 1 this morning near Prue Road in Houseman. Police say two drivers got in an argument and got out of their vehicles. That's when one of the drivers shot the other in both legs. That victim, a 38-year-old man, was somehow able to drive back to his apartment and call for help. He was taken to University Hospital and is expected to recover. That shooter has not been found. Texas Governor Greg Abbott continuing to try to send a message to the Biden administration by busing migrants north. This time they were dropped off. People were dropped off near the vice president's residence in D.C. Two busloads of people, many carrying trash bags full of their stuff. The majority of them are from Venezuela, a country facing a severe humanitarian emergency right now. The Human Rights Watch says people there are struggling with getting food, safe drinking water and basic health care. Once they get to the United States, though, many say they've now become political pawns in the battle over border politics. It's a terrific idea. Um, I don't know how else to get President Biden's and Vice President Harris's attention to the broken borders uh, that we have in uh, Texas and all across U.S.-Mexico border. He was using human beings, babies, uh, families as political piñatas to, for a political stunt by bringing these buses at 6 o'clock in the morning. Many of these refugees, by the way, have health issues. The, the Division for Emergency Management says the state has spent more than $12 million so far busing migrants out of state. The governors of Florida and Arizona have been pushing them out as well. By the way, speaking of Florida, if Florida's governor has claimed responsibility for the nearly 50 migrants flown into Massachusetts yesterday. But those flights to vacation hotspot Martha's Vineyard started from right here in San Antonio. Tonight on the Night Beat, the broken promise that some of the migrants on board say they were counting on. It's on the Night Beat tonight. It is a done deal. San Antonio City Council passing a $3.4 billion budget today with more money for police, affordable housing, and pay raises for city employees. It also had a plan to send a chunk of the unexpectedly high CPS energy revenues back to ratepayers. Residential customers should see credits averaging 29 bucks on their November or December bills. However, City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us the council was deeply divided on that rebate idea budget passed on a 9-1 vote this afternoon, but the vote that really mattered was an earlier amendment that split the council straight down the middle. Stressing the need for more time to talk over alternatives, almost half the city council tried to park $42.5 million meant for bill credits into a reserve fund. Almost half, but not more than half. Motion fails. The plan they were bucking against was drawn up by city staff to deal with the unexpected windfall of CPS energy revenue that results from high temperatures and high natural gas prices. Seven and a half million will go to a low income assistance program, but the controversial part was giving the bill credits back to customers, to businesses and residents alike inside the city and out. These funds are are your money. But District One Councilman Mario Bravo and others think the credit money, which will vary customer to customer based on their bill size, will be better used preparing for future extreme weather. The mayor just talked about an equity lens. There's no equity lens here. This flips the equity f lens around. We've got $19 million in corporate welfare in this. 
It's not just council members who were divided. It belongs to the people of the city. Money going to Microsoft, Home Depot, McDonald's. I mean, these, these people don't need any help or money. The tie vote with District 7 Councilwoman Ana Sandoval abstaining meant the attempt to delay failed. And the plan moved forward as part of the final budget, which passed easily. <laughs> Sandoval had her own climate resiliency proposal in this budget, which uses a smaller share of CPS money on an annual basis. Pressed after the meeting on why she'd abstained from the vote on delaying or moving ahead with the extra revenue, she told KSAT, quote, because I didn't support either one. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic on this Thursday. Let's go to 281 in San Pedro, usually kind of a busy area, and you can see things are actually moving along very smoothly right out there by the airport. And look how green the grass is in that view. For now. <laughs> for now. We'll take it for now. <laughs> hey, we talked yesterday how we got cooler temperatures at this time of day, but let's talk about the mornings. That was awesome. Oh, yeah, especially for folks that ventured out to the bus stop, you know, around it a little before sunrise. We were down in the 60s and even some 50s in the hill country. Kerrville dropped down to 57, Fredericksburg 59. We had a low temperature officially in San Antonio that measured at the airport, of course, of 67. And that was the coolest reading we've seen around here since May 26. So pretty significant uh, when you put it into perspective. It's been since late May that we've been that cool. It's not going to last. I'm sorry. Our mornings temperatures are on the upswing. We had one little shower pop up around Yorktown just over the past hour. That's it. Outflow boundary is heading westward right now. I doubt it's going to develop anything. There's the off chance, about a 10% chance. That's about it. But around town, I think we'll be dry. 91 right now, 82 at 10 o'clock. We'll talk more about the morning temperatures and the humidity, how that changes in the days ahead and the latest track before hurricane or not hurricane, tropical storm Fiona in just a bit. A deal has been reached with union freight train workers and management, essentially averting what could have been a major crisis on U.S. railways. The looming strike was going to wreak havoc on U.S. supply chains as well as passenger rail travel. The White House calling the agreement an important win for our economy. Chris Nguyen breaks down the terms of the deal. Crisis averted. This would have been catastrophic. Railroad unions and management reached a tentative deal Thursday preventing a strike that could have brought 30 percent of the nation's freight to a grinding halt and pushed prices higher for many goods. Had we had a rail strike, uh, it would have cost the economy two billion dollars per day of that strike. Thursday, President Joe Biden appeared with negotiators at the White House after personally calling in during the talks the previous night. This agreement is a big win for America. The tentative deal gives union engineers and conductors a 24% raise during the five-year life of the contract, which runs from 2020 through 2024. Back pay and bonuses will give them an average of an $11,000 payment per person once the deal is ratified. Union leadership releasing a joint statement saying in part, most importantly for the first First time ever, the agreement provides our members with the ability to take time away from work to attend to routine and preventive medical care, as well as exemptions from attendance policies for hospitalizations and surgical procedures. Sources within the unions gave the president credit for helping to get the deal completed without a strike. They'll be able to continue to operate effectively as a vital piece of our economy. They're really the backbone of the economy. In Washington, I'm Chris Wynn. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying high above Woodlawn Lake. Yeah, not quite as green in this view. Yeah, as, uh... <laughs> but I do like the shot of the lake it's and then beautiful. downtown. It's yeah. very, very nice view there. And not a bad evening to get out and enjoy it, Adam. No, you know, we've been lucky the past couple of evenings. We've had some not as humid conditions is the way I'll put it. I don't want to say fall like or very crisp, but it's just not quite as muggy. And that led to the coolest morning since May 26. We talked about that earlier. Let's take a look at our temperature trend for those morning readings. Our low temperature typically comes around sunrise. We'll be 73 tomorrow, 75 on Saturday, 76 for the morning low temperature by Sunday and into next week. So definitely warmer and muggier mornings on the way. Look at temperatures across the state, 80s to near 90 for the most part. Lubbock, an exception at 76, and Amarillo, another exception at 66, but 90 in Junction, 89 Abilene, even Houston, 87 degrees, Pleasanton, 91, Del Rio at 88. 
right around 90 degrees, give or take a few degrees out there. Dew points right near 60 and in some cases into the lower 60s. Officially at the airport, a dew point of 61. Not all that bad, however, the humidity in the dew point is really going to jump later on tonight. I mean, we're going to see that dew point up near 70 degrees overnight and into the morning part of at least to start the day tomorrow. And that's going to lead to the warmer morning. So 73 in Hondo, 71 Canyon Lake, some upper 60s in the hill country, Catula 75 in the morning, and then by the afternoon we'll see those readings back into the 90s. We hit 92 for the high temperature today. We'll be pretty close to that tomorrow. New Braunfels, and Seguin, 93. West side, Lackland area, about 92. And Holotus, closer to 90. And our high temperature trend doesn't change much. The average high is 90. We're going to be low to mid 90s for at least the next seven days. Actually, a little more of a summer-like weather pattern is going to be settling in, and that's going to keep us high and dry. So let's talk about that weather pattern. First of all, the new drought monitor is in, and it really wasn't a big change compared to last week. Some subtle improvements off to the west of San Antonio, but no big changes coming up next half hour. I'll compare it to four weeks ago. That is a significant change. We'll look at that in a bit, but across the state, 59% of Texas is considered in drought and that may sound bad, but that's a huge improvement considering about a month month ago we were nearly 90% of Texas in drought. So big time changes. All right, here's a look at satellite and radar. You saw those cooler readings up in the panhandle. It's because we have some rain up there. That's where we have a few thunderstorms. And we had a few of those weak pop-up showers closer to the Gulf Coast today. I think that's going to be the trend in the days ahead, just closer to the Gulf Coast, one or two in the afternoon. One upper level high is exiting. Well, Big Blue H is moving out of here, but it's going to be replaced by another one. And this one coming in from northern Mexico is going to settle overhead and just sit for several days, for about a week straight, keeping us dry and deflecting all the rain and active weather away from us. As for Tropical Storm Fiona, high-end Tropical Storm, max sustained winds up to 60 miles per hour now, gusting up to 70. So likely to just go westward, skim through the Northern Caribbean, some of the islands out there, Puerto Rico, Haiti, Dominican Republic, before turning northward toward the Bahamas by early part of next week as a likely a high-end Tropical Storm at that time. Right now, the forecast keeps it just under hurricane status and no threat to the east coast of the U.S. I think even thereafter, it should stay off the eastern seaboard. Anyway, 73 in the morning tomorrow at 7 a.m. By 10 a.m., we're already at 81. 1 p.m. will hit 90 and then a high temperature on 4 p.m. of 93 degrees. And notice that 10 percent chance of a stray shower. You know, we could see one or two popping up the next couple of afternoons, but I think mostly closer to the Gulf coastline is where that's going to be even as we go into next week. Thank you, Adam. All right, it's getting a lot of attention locally. UTSA, UT Austin. They play this weekend, Saturday night, right, Larry? Yes, they do. And UTSA football just kicked things up a notch. Social okay. media is going crazy over this video that UTSA tweeted out of their uniform combo, and it was a shot in and around Austin, including on Longhorns campus. Plus, in Carter Word football is off to a red hot start. Coming up. We're excited. It'll be loud, I'm sure. So we're going to have to be able to be able to focus and, and lock in on each other and focus on us. Brendan Brady and the Roadrunners are getting ready to play football at DKR Texas Memorial Stadium in Big Board Sports. UTSA and number 21 Texas will meet for the first time on the gridiron on Saturday night in Austin. The Roadrunners are getting ready to face a top 25 team for the third time in their last four games, dating back to the 2021 Frisco Bowl. Fresh off a 41-38 overtime win at Army West Point, the Roadrunners will now try to beat a Texas squad that barely lost to number one Alabama 20-19. Yeah, I mean, you come off with the, what they did last week, you know, a team playing Alabama that close, the number one team in the country, that it'll be a good challenge, uh, it'll be a good atmosphere, you know, our fans will be able to go and, you know, they're going to pack that stadium, so it'll be a great atmosphere and we're just excited to play that team. 
And how about this bold move? UTSA football tweeted video of their uniform combo for that Saturday game, and it was shot in Austin, including on the Longhorns campus. UTSA is going with the blue helmet, white jersey, and blue pants. Over at Incarnate Word, the Cardinals are feeling pretty good after winning at the University of Nevada 55-41. UIW trailed 17-3 before they turned things around to beat the Wolfpack. Incarnate Word is now 2-0, and they want to keep rolling Saturday night at Prairie View A&M University. Credit to all our hard work over the, over the summer, man. We put in so much work over the summer, and like the vision was always there, you know. So um, we're obviously not surprised, and we haven't really played our best game yet. But we're all coming together, and we have our best football is yet ahead. Well, we're really confident, but at the same time, you know what I'm saying. We, we know we could. We have. We still haven't put it together. You know what I'm saying. A perfect game like we've been chasing. So we just, uh, just keep trying to get better. We haven't played our best game yet. And Carter Ward is number six in the FCS Stats Perform poll, the highest ranking in program history. It is time to get buff along with the Marion Bulldogs football team. The guys were lifting weights yesterday when we stopped by to preview their game with against the Carn City Badgers. The Bulldogs are 2-1 entering their final non-district matchup. In week one, they edged out Hondo 21-20. In week two, they beat Natalia 35-17. And last week, they lost at Gonzalez 27-13. I feel confident about it. You know, we have some people out, but we're hoping district, they're back and healthy, come back strong. Uh, as a team, we're doing good. We need to work on some stuff, tackling, but during practice, we've been working hard and we're going to get it done. Pretty confident. We're, we got a great bunch of guys. The team chemistry is amazing with us group. We've been playing with each other all the way through middle school. It's just it's great. Uh, I feel great. You know, we've had a couple injuries uh, in the past few practices and past few games, but, you know, we got to do we got to do what we do, what we got, you know, but I feel great, you know, coming on to the, you know, come off a loss against Gonzalez, you know, but I feel good about this game. Marion will host Carn City tomorrow night at 7 to kick off the BGC road trip, followed by stops in Lavernia and Stockdale. I'm very excited, very ready, and uh, I'm more than prepared to go out there and perform Saturday night. WBC Super Flyweight Champion Jesse Bam Rodriguez will look to defend his belt Saturday night in Las Vegas against Israel Gonzalez. 210 Bam is 16 0 with 11 knockouts and will put his skills on display as the co main event to Canelo and Triple G in their trilogy fight. You can catch the bout on DAZN pay per view. Bam! Bam indeed. I like that. Bam, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Our KSAP QA is coming up next. They say that the campaigns really don't begin until after Labor Day. And if you've been watching any of our newscasts, you know that's probably true with the amount of advertising that you've been seeing from different candidates. So we wanted to talk politics today with James Balagan. He's the politi politics reporter with the Texas Tribune. James, we've had you on before. Always appreciate you making time for us. Obviously, when you look at the state races, the governor's race is the biggest. There's a poll that was just out today, I believe, that showed that uh, Governor Abbott has a five point lead over Beto O'Rourke. At one point, there was some speculation that the governor's office didn't even think they needed to do a debate. Obviously, they've changed their mind on that, that debate happening at the end of this month. How are you viewing this race and how important is that debate that's going to take place in Edinburgh later later this month? Yeah, well, I think no doubt. Um, I, I think this is still Governor Greg Abbott's race to lose. Um, the polling has shown him ahead uh, 7%, 6%. But now this 5% starts getting in that range where it's like, huh, that's that's pretty close, you know? And to your point, that debate that everyone thought, well, it's just going to be one debate, it really raises the stakes for both Beto O'Rourke, the Democratic challenger, and for Governor Abbott to sort of try to avoid making any mistakes that would allow for Beto O'Rourke to make inroads with that 5% of voters where he can sort of start changing the tide and start making this race a little bit closer. So no doubt that debate is going to be more important. Um, and, and yeah, it looks like it's, it's tightening a little bit. But, you know, at the end of the day, the only uh, poll that matters is in November. So we'd still got to wait two months, uh, but I'm sure your, your, your viewers will be seeing a lot more campaigning uh, until then. Absolutely, and a lot more advertising as well on, on our airwaves. I, I also want to talk about G Governor Abbott. We have seen Beto O'Rourke debate Ted Cruz, who's, who's by all accounts a, an accomplished debater. Have we ever seen Governor Abbott debate someone as experienced as Beto O'Rourke? 
Well, I think, you know, Governor Abbott is a, a, a great legal mind. He's a litigator. I mean, this is kind of what he does as a lawyer. He's ready for arguments. So I don't think he's super worried in those respects. Um, I think, like I said, he's worried about trying not to make mistakes and about making the presentation of his arguments. You know, he's really big right now on border security. He says this is the number one issue in the state, and that's going to be one of the issues that uh, win him the election. But there's other issues like abortion where uh, voters right now are having second thoughts of the uh, uh, restrictive abortion law that the state legislator just passed, and they're having struggling on sort of talking points. So that's that's what I mean, where he has to figure out how to talk about those issues in a way that won't turn off voters, will keep them on his sides, and that's the big challenge for him. Everybody knows the governor's race is certainly the one to watch uh, statewide and most people familiar with things happening locally. But I'm curious if there is a race that you're watching in the House and the Senate uh, in Texas that maybe you think will be pivotal for the rest of the state, have a much wider impact for the rest of us, even if we're not in those districts. Yeah, well, I think in in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, um, there's a couple of races there where uh, congressional seats have been traditionally held by Democrats uh, in districts 15, 34, and 28. Um, Henry Cuellar's district, uh, Vicente Gonzalez's district, um, and now Myra Flores' district. She flipped that district when Philemon Vela retired. Um, and so those are ones that I'm really interested in because they're key to Republicans attempts to try to take back the House, but they would also be sort of a, a big win for Republicans if they were able to flip these seats in, in uh, areas of South Texas have, that have traditionally for decades and decades been Democratic, and now Republicans, if they were able to flip those, those would be incredibly significant. Obviously, it, there seems to be a feeling out there, at least among Republicans, that Henry Cuellar is vulnerable, vulnerable because he had to go to a runoff uh, with Jessica Cisneros. They had to have a recount to decide who was going to actually win that seat. Are you hearing the same thing? Well, I think there's there's definitely a lot of concern uh, there in 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 in, in Laredo about Cuellar, among Democratic circles about Cuellar's um, uh, chances in in the race. I think the bigger concern was really in that Democratic primary because we do see this sort of generational divide among particularly Hispanic voters, where older Hispanic voters are a little bit more conservative, younger Hispanic voters tend to be more progressive, more liberal. So I think that's what you saw in that geo, uh, in that dem Democratic primary. I think from just what we've been seeing and hearing and talking to political experts, there's less concern now about Henry Cuellar, um, and, and they think that he has better chances. But nonetheless, Republicans are on the offensive in, in all three of those congressional uh, races. So I would not I would not take my foot off the gas pedal if I was one of those Democratic candidates. You know, there's an issue at play here leading up to this election outside of just those top tier topics that are being debated among candidates. Election integrity. We are seeing elections offices, including right here in our area, face lawsuits questioning uh, what's happening during the, the vote counting process. So how are you seeing that play out throughout the state? Yeah, we've definitely seen this um, as fallout after the 2020 presidential elections coming obviously from the top with President Donald Trump questioning the results of that election. We've seen numerous GOP candidates throughout the country who still have questions and still raise doubts about the validity of the 2020 presidential elections. And that teeters down to a local level where local elections administrators are having to deal with a lot more harassment. Um, they're having to deal with a lot more questions, in some cases lawsuits, about how they handled, how they administered those elections, even though they're doing what they've been doing for years and f going by the letter of the law. Um, but there is obviously much more attention being paid to it by some actors also, it has to be said, who have uh, you know, purely political reasons for doing this. So I think that is a big concern for this election cycle and for the 2024 presidential election cycle, especially if President Donald Trump does try to run again in 2024. James, you, you work for the Texas Tribune, and I know one of the big things that they do every year is the Tribune Fest. It takes place in Austin. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, it's, it's really where politics, policymakers all come together and basically take questions, and, it, and it's, it's a free and open forum, correct? 
Yeah, it's the goal of the Texas Tribune realized in person. And we used to do this accessible in person all the time. Obviously, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we couldn't do it. But this year, we're back fully in person. Um, on Saturday, September 24th, we'll be taking over uh, Congress Avenue in Austin for completely free programming uh, that you can attend. We'll be dealing with issues about next year's legislative session, this upcoming election cycle, um, the Uvalde school shooting, which obviously still has a lot of ramifications for policy and for politics. Um, and there will be some fun stuff, too. If you're not into politics, uh, NBA superstar Chris Bosh is going to be there. Um, there's going to be things that are outside of politics as well. Uh, Lyle Lovett, uh, American singer-songwriter, will also be there. Again, completely free on September 24th on Congress. And there is obviously a lot more um, uh, panels. We have, I think, 350 speakers on 120 panels that will We'll go through the rest of the festival, which starts on Thursday, September 22nd and ends on Saturday, September 24th. And you can always find out more information on tripfest.org. But we're extremely excited to be back in person. Yeah, there's some big names involved with all of those different panelists in September 24th, the free day. So that's the one uh, to keep everybody's eye on. James, thank you so much for being here. I sure appreciate it. Thank you all. Take care. We'll be right back. In the buzz today, Nick Cannon announcing the birth of his ninth child as he awaits two more. The Mask Singer host announced on Instagram the arrival of Onyx Ice Cole Cannon, his daughter with model Lanisha Cole. He posted a photo of the three of them together. He welcomed his eighth child in July, a son with Bree Ticey. Cannon also shares twins with his ex-wife, singer Mariah Carey, a son and daughter with model Brittany Bell, and twin sons with DJ Abby De La Rosa. Ryan Reynolds used to being on camera. This is a little different, though. The actor allowed a video crew to film his colonoscopy screening, saying it's not every day that you can raise awareness about something that most that will most definitely save lives, end quote. More people under 50 getting diagnosed with colorectal cancer now more than they were a decade ago. A colonoscopy involves using a tiny camera to look through the colon for small growths known as polyps that can turn cancerous. The doctor found a small one during Reynolds' procedure. When he gave the actor the news, he said, quote, this was potentially life-saving for you. This is exactly why you do this. So Ryan Reynolds and I have at least one thing in common. That's right, yeah. you do. Yeah. Since He's I, done I, it. Yeah, I had a camera go with me on my colonoscopy. Like I said, it's a story that begins with the end. Wow. Wow. It begins with the end. Wow, yes. wow. Yeah. Okay. All right, Just, at 90 degree, get your colonoscopies yeah. out. Yes, absolutely, that is yeah. true, but I am going to take this in a different direction now. Good. I do Go. support that 100%. All right, our temperature right now, 91 degrees. We'll be down in the 80s pretty quickly by 10 o'clock, 82. Really not much of a rain chance out there. I think there's the very off chance one or two could pop up still over the next hour or so, but it's highly unlikely. Looking ahead, a more summer like weather pattern is going to settle in. We'll talk about that where the big heat high is going to be, along with a comparison of the new drought monitor to several weeks ago, what kind of improvements we've made. And of course, a very special thermometer Thursday today. We're going to get to in just a bit. All right, it is Thursday. Of course, you know what that means, but I've been getting very excited, not just about thermometers on Thursdays, drought monitors. Yeah, that's true. You know it's been dry when I'm <laughs> eager to see the drought monitor. Yeah, that's true. And you're eager to see it, so we've been moving in the right direction. That's right. That's a good thing. Positive news here. So warmer mornings are ahead. I know earlier today, 67, the coolest we've been since May 26th. That's coming to a screeching halt. Minimal rain chances as the upper level heat high starts to settle overhead and temperatures above average as a result. All right, let's look at the drought monitor from four weeks ago. That's what you see on your screen. Four weeks ago, take a close look. Exceptional and extreme drought all across the KSAT 12 viewing area, south and central Texas. Here we go, three, two, one, and look at those improvements. And I like to show you that big span of four weeks because typically it takes a long time to pull yourself out of drought. And compared to last week, there wasn't a whole lot of change, just a little bit chipped away off to our west. That's about it. But still, obviously, we have more work to do. Well, not that we can do anything about it, but you know what I mean. We really need more rain and could use more, but we're moving in the right direction. 59% of the state considered in drought. Over the past four weeks, the two worst categories, exceptional category, 
down 26% and extreme down 28%. So it's good to see that. Today, the shower activity, just a few isolated showers up in the panhandle and a few of them popped up closer to the Gulf coastline. Not a big deal. I, yes, some severe weather in the panhandle, but it's highly isolated and nothing severe along the Gulf Coast. Just a few isolated pop ups. One upper level high is off to our east. That's moving out of here, but it's going to be replaced by another upper level high. Big blue H heat high sitting overhead and it's just going to park itself over Texas and then really not move much, just drift around overhead from this weekend all the way through next week. So that deflects all the rain around us, which is good news for the desert southwest in terms of them getting more showers, feeding some moisture up there into the four corner states. But not for us. That keeps us dry. I mean, we've got that 10% chance again tomorrow and even on into Saturday. Then we're down basically to 0% Sunday through next week. If you're close to the Gulf Coast line, within say 50 60 miles maybe you'll see a rogue pop up but that's about it okay tropical storm fiona let's get to it max sustained winds of 70 or 60 miles per hour gusting up to 70 so the winds haven't really changed with the recent update that just came out still had, hurricane center has it on a westerly track here into the northern caribbean uh, just brushing by, maybe even making landfall over Puerto Rico and then potentially Dominican Republic as well before starting to take that turn to the north. And here are the spaghetti plots and you see they're tightly packed at first. Then you get to Dominican Republic and they're generally indicating that turn northward to parallel to the U.S. East Coast, but it's not a slam dunk. There's a lot of uncertainty on what's going to happen there. Around here, you see our clouds trying to bubble up, but they didn't have much success. So we didn't see any showers around town today, and I think it's going to be the trend for a while here. 67 this morning, it was refreshing. My mother-in-law who's visiting even had to grab a light coat, just not used to it, right? 92 degrees, our high temperature, the average be 90. And overall, I mean, we're not that far from average now, but we will be above average in the days ahead. 91 currently dew point is 61. We're right around 90 degrees pretty much everywhere. 87 Holotus, Stinson 93, and tomorrow morning we'll start the day in the lower 70s, 73 for most of us, some upper 60s in the hill country, and then low 90s by the afternoon. Some morning clouds, otherwise a fairly sunny day. I think noticeable clouds early than just the patchy fair weather variety later on. In mid 90s, that's going to be the rule this weekend, especially Sunday through next week. All right, it's time to calibrate good times. <laughs> Calibrate good I was times. Really Come on. The calibration. We calibrate. Song. Yeah. It's a calibration. <laughs> All right, let's get right to it. Doing my first calibration point. We talked about calibration a little bit last week. I'm going to start from the top of the thermometer and work my way down. So I want to get something that's around 100 degrees. I get hot water in my insulated mug there, cover it with foil, and then insert a straw. Why? I'm not drinking the water. I am blowing bubbles into the water to continuously circulate it because, you know, the water temperature may modify a few tenths of a degree, maybe even up to a degree. And so I circulate it in, in order to keep it really well mixed with my very accurate, highly responsive thermometer there. I mark the level with an extra fine point marker the level at which the alcohol is within the thermometer. And then on a piece of paper, I note that thermometer. This was 102.0 degrees and I just marked that on the thermometer. So now we know where that mark is. It's 102 degrees. Obviously, we have a lot of lot more work to do and more calibration points. I'll be taking you from the top of the thermometer all the way down in how I calibrate it. Then from there, from those calibration points, generate a scale to fill in the gaps in between. I could go on and on about this. It's so fun. It's <laughs> yeah, so good. awesome. All right. So today's winner out of Garden Ridge, Pamela Kamasi. Kamasi? Well, Pamela, you know, I sent you the email and you just replied to me. So yes, congratulations. Go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. The big banner at the top is what you click on. Any uh, encore performance of the I, I calibration just, song? Yeah, I mean, there's a party going on right here. <laughs> a calibration. calibration. Last throughout the year. Yeah. I'll be right back. Love it.
It's Thursday, the 15th of September. A woman convicted of killing her ex-husband will spend the better part of three decades behind bars. Crystal Rodriguez was sentenced to 28 years this morning as part of a plea deal. The two were in the process of a divorce when 40-year-old Jared Rodriguez was found dead inside of his home on Pine Country, along with one of the couple's small children. His estranged wife, Crystal, was arrested later at a different location and charged with murder. The search is on for a man who stole thousands of dollars worth of merchandise from an optometrist's office last week. It happened about 2 in the morning on September 5th. It was at the Bernie Vision Center off of I-10. The Bear County Sheriff's Office's surveillance photos show a man in a mask breaking into the center, placing merchandise in a tub before driving off in a white van. Deputies believe the merchandise was worth between thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. If you know anything that can help in this case and help find that suspect, you're asked to call BCSO with the number on your screen, 210-335-6000. Mortgage rates have reached their highest level since 2008. Today, Freddie Mac reported the 30-year fixed rate mortgage now averages around 6.02 percent. That's up from 5.89 percent the week before. It's also more than twice the rate from a year ago when it was 2.86. 6%. Mortgage rates have been rising since the Federal Reserve began efforts to reduce inflation. Check this out. A UTSA professor visited a thrift store in Georgia and walked away with a rare treasure. William Pugh came across an original painting by cherished African-American artist Keith Bankston. It only cost him $125 and he ended up donating it to a collection at a museum in Georgia. You can read more about these stories on KSAT.com. See you on the night beat and at nine tonight.